Uh, it's my pleasure to start the second keynote session for today and to introduce our honorable guest, guest uh, Marta Kretkowska. Let me say a couple of words about uh, her. She is a professor of computer science, uh, system and a fellow of Trinity College, University of Oxford. She is known for fundamental contributions to the theory and practice of model checking for probabilistic systems and is currently focusing on safety, robustness and fairness of automated decision making in artificial intelligence. So, uh, instead, it, it's a very nice continuation what uh, in the first part of today's session uh, we had. Her research has been supported by our ERC advanced grants. Uh, the title of this uh, grant is very rare and fun to model. And Professor Kletkowska won the Royal Society Milner Award, PCS Lovelace um, Medal, and Van Wiengarden Award, and received an honorary uh, doctorate from Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. She is a fellow of Royal Society, fellow of ICM, and member of Academia of Europea. And she is also a full professor of uh, in, in Poland here. It's, it's uh, <laughs> what um, our guest asked me to mention. So, uh, thank you. Um, good afternoon, and it is great to be here. This is the country where I was born. This is not the city where I went to university. I went to the university in the other place, so it's a little bit like Oxford and Cambridge. I went to university in Krakow. Uh, and uh, in, in particular, it is really great to be, uh, to be here and talk about uh, what is a very exciting time for our discipline because of what's happening in AI. Uh, I think you know, there are some connections to a previous keynote, and I'll try to link them a little bit. So to start with, AI, artificial intelligence, was conceived by John McCarthy. And to start with, it was based on trying to emulate human reasoning using logic frameworks and knowledge reasoning. But more recently, what we've seen is a huge rise of deep learning, and in particular neural networks. So neural networks do connect to the previous talk because they are decision functions. In particular, classification can be implemented as a neural network. But I will explain the difference when I get to that later. Now, neural networks themselves are also quite old, because they go back to the 1940s. Um, and they were, to start with, just a pencil and paper exercise. They were trying to model the way that the human brain works. And then what happened was that with the amount of data that's available because of social media and you know human-labeled photos and and the like, and also the technology, computing technology catching up, uh, they suddenly took off and started beating humans and winning awards, and in particular they were recognized through the top award in computer science. Um, so, because of that, we now have deep learning with Editing. We have deep learning in face recognition, we have deep learning in autonomous driving, and also in medical diagnosis. And if you've been following what Elon Musk is doing, or has been doing, uh, when he's not doing Twitter or X, the stakes are rising higher. Uh, because he's actually got brain implants improved, and he's working towards, some people say cyborgs, but cybernetics is of course what this university was known for, I think, back in the 70s and in the 80s. 
Okay. Um, right, so where are we? I use this as an example as an introduction to say, should we worry about AI safety? I come from the formal methods background, you know, formal verification. So for me, it is a natural question. But to kind of give you uh, a little example is what you see on the left there is, you know, a typical urban city. So this is actually a dashboard camera image. And uh, what we did is we trained a neural network. This was an award winning neural network that classifies these into scenes that have a red traffic light or a green traffic light. And then with my students software you can find just one pixel. If you change that pixel to green, something that was classified as a red traffic light is suddenly classified as green. This is potentially catastrophic if the car is not doing anything else. And pretty sure that they have various fallback strategies. Now, you might say, well, this is not a natural image. I've changed a pixel to give you a natural image in the real physical attack, which was demonstrated on the Tesla. What you see is the picture in the middle. If you look at three, it is elongated. And in fact, it actually through the network's classification. Now, if you've been watching the news, there were real cars that were uh, uh, driving around the UK which actually misread signs, okay? They are not autonomous driving, they were part of um, assistance, driver assistance, okay? And the last example is an example of how difficult this problem is because these are real traffic signs in Alaska. So, the point that occurred to me back in 2016, we really need stronger methodologies to provide safety assurance. Well, so what happened to self-driving cars? According to Elon Musk, we were supposed to have them by 2020. That's level five for autonomy. Now, a lot of manufacturers are now scaling back, going back to level four, which is in defined environments. Why? Well, because there were some accidents, some high profile, some less high profile. Um, but what you also see on the right is San Francisco. Uh, last month, introduced robot taxis. You can get them 24 seven, and there are two companies that are actually, you know, trying to introduce them. And unfortunately, uh, San Francisco residents are not that happy and they are actually, they've uh, written a petition now to try to look at that regulation again. Um, and, well, the road is bumpy for self-driving cars, but it is actually bounty for all new technologies. So this is a made up example, but this is actually a real law, which was introduced at the end of the 19th century in the UK and also in parts of the US. Uh, it forced automobiles to drive at a human walker speed which was four miles per hour, and they had to have a person walking in front of them and waving a red flag. I'm not making this up. You can read about it in history books. And it's used as you know, an example for how not to introduce new technologies. So the point here is that you know, both the vehicles as well as the regulation, the laws, they have to be fit for purpose, and especially in complex urban environments such as San Francisco. So what has this got to do with trust? Okay, uh, to trust or not to trust, I couldn't resist. But first, what is trust? 
trust is very well explained in this context of self-driving and more generally humans interacting with robots as the willingness uh, to actually depend on and be vulnerable to the actions of the robot. Uh, I mean, the driver is, I think so is the person cared by an assistive care robot. It is a subjective notion. I have a very different attitude towards self-driving from my husband, for example. It is multifaceted, but once it's lost, it's very difficult to build it up. Now, but then, trust. Trust what? Okay, who? You know, who is responsible? Who is ultimately responsible? For non-self-driving cars, we know there is regulation, there are safety processes, there's managed remanufacturing, etc. But for autonomous driving, these are still not fully developed. They are still catching up. But trust is essential because it guides reliance. So it guides things like over-trust, under-trust, use, under-use, over-use, misuse. Uh, but of course, the point that I'm making, because I come from foreign methods, is you can increase trust in AI and robots by uh, using sound engineering practices and also mathematics. And there is an explicit link to the previous talk. So what we have here is a very complex uh, AI safety problem. Uh, and you know, I'm not trying to downplay, it is an incredibly difficult problem to actually control a car that's driving around San Francisco. The question is, because they have full autonomy, uh, and there is, you know, no driver, if they stop, if someone puts a cone, you know, then they stop, they block the roads, they can actually block emergency services. So it is very, very difficult, but perhaps we really need to think about the infrastructure, I think, for those cars to enable safe driving, because it is a safety-critical situation, and of course, should failure occur, we need accountability, but before we can talk about accountability, we need evidence. Now, the law in San Francisco was introduced and the companies are not required to even collect data about, you know, driving accidents. So, that's just beside the point. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this lecture, I'm going to give you a few highlights, because my focus is you know, trust, gaining trust in robots and in you know, autonomous systems and self-driving cars through rigorous engineering. I would say even more than sound, mathematically, you know, principled, mathematically based. Um, and I will start by giving you a brief recap of uh, neural networks, what robustness uh, is and uh, how you can actually provide guarantees of robustness at a high level. Um, and I focus on robustness, but of course robustness is key to safety, but not only to safety, also to fairness and various other properties that I don't have time to talk about. But there is a paper, there is an overview paper which you can find in the proceedings. And I will finish up, I'll give you just one snapshot of explainability, another link to, uh, to, previous, to a previous talk, and I'll finish with some perspectives. Okay, so how do I do this rigorous engineering? Well, I have been working for quite some time now, we are going back to the late 90s, on form verification, which can be applied to software verification, where you know you take a piece of Java code, you can extract a model from it, uh, and then the idea is that you want to prove correctness 
of that extracted model that you can then take back to the real software. And I focused on these probabilistic models because networks, for example, you know, or Wi-Fi just works with randomization, but there are also other types of annotations that you can use, timing, you know, etc. So the verification in that case is a proof that the model satisfies a given specification, but that proof is actually done through a piece of software called a model checker, and the model checker just runs an algorithm. So it's typically limited to finite models. What you can also do is you can synthesize models that are then correct by construction. And we are doing that, but what we are doing more recently is we've actually turned to looking at neural networks and developing software for verification techniques for neural networks. Okay, so what are neural networks? Okay, so at one level, neural networks are simpler than code. For a start, they don't have roots. You know, so I focused on feed forward. Okay, what they do have is they have very high dimensionality, and another thing that they have is that the weights are trained. Now, the weights are trained using optimization problems, optimization software, like the one that we heard about. Okay, but this is non linear optimization. So, you know, in fact, what they are trained to do is to optimize performance, that is the accuracy on the test data set. They're not optimized for robustness. In the previous talk, we, talk, we heard about how to develop systems that are robust, not neural networks. They are trained to optimize performance, and because this is non-linear optimization, we don't even have a guarantee that A can reach the optimum. You know, that's the fact. Um, so, okay, on the one hand they are simple, on the other hand they are incredibly difficult. For us computer scientists, another computer scientist, we are trained on discrete maths. You know, I actually in Krakow I had analysis so, uh, based on the book by Brodin, but a lot of computer scientists are just not very familiar with real numbers and what neural networks work on because they are trained using optimization. They take discrete inputs, such as images, which are matrices of pixels, they turn them into real values. Okay, and that's a, that's a fact. That's because of the constraints. So they are black box, uh, they are, you know, uh, bugs, uh, not problems with logic. They essentially are trained to interpolate not extrapolate, train to interpolate. Um, and uh, accuracy, yeah, we'll show later, can be misleading. But the point is that if we are successful, we can then have guarantees of some sort, and you can have certification. So if you can compute guarantees, you can, for example, certify that up to three pixels you know, however you modify, you will not change the classification of the image. Okay, that's, that's the point of this work. And longer term, you would like to learn robust networks, but we are making very slow progress in that direction. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to say is, well, um, neural networks are complicated, but also the problem that we have to solve for something like perception in self-driving cars is incredibly complicated. As you can see here, you know, a few examples of traffic sounds, and is it a real duck? Or is it a sign, you know, with a real duck? These are real problems. And in fact, you know, there are a lot of labelers, human labelers, labeling, you know, data obtained from the autonomous cars, typically in Africa, because they are essential to train, you know, better, better models. But in fact, you know, another problem is that we are limited 
in the technology that we are using. But because when we are talking about things like images, what we want to measure is a similarity between that 30 speed limit and the slightly modified 30 speed limit. But this is a very hard problem. There are solutions in computer graphics known as Mahalanobis dif distance between two images, but they are just too complex to use and especially at real time. So what people are working with is LP norms, which are proxies. They have nothing to do with similarity, and they only work for very small uh, distances. So what we need is we need better notions of semantic robustness. Uh, but that's slow coming, because the problem is difficult. OK, so just to explain, on um, a very simple example, what checking robustness would mean. And this is known as local robustness or pointwise robustness. Because I don't consider the full input of the network, I only consider a trans network and a specific point, here x, in some region of images that are supposed to be similar. And I'm going to say, well, the decision in that region will be robust, that is safe, if it is invariant. That is, if the classification decision does not change. And this is defined only for uh, you know, uh, a region, but I can also combine it you know, with operations. For example, changing angle you know, is developed in computer graphics. But I'm only showing you a very simple example of this uh, you know, pointwise robustness. Now, how do we compute robustness? In that region, if you have an adversarial example, that means that the classification may change, uh, like this point y. So I want to compute as a guarantee that such a point does not exist, okay? But computing that, even if I could compute it, this would mean computing the distance to the decision boundary. Uh, but that is computationally intractable, so what we are working with is lower bounding the distance and upper bounding the distance. Okay? Upper bounding the distance is called adversarial example search, and finding one is actually a witness of lack of robustness, and the lower bound means doing some exhaustive search, exhaustive search so that I can rule out adversarial robustness up to the lower bound. Now, when we started working on this in 2016, we applied a very simple approach. Now, the problem with that, with even the local robustness, is that the number of points, because I'm working with RN inputs, the number of points is infinite. In fact, it's uncountable. And I want to do an exhaustive search up to some lower bound. So what we do is we rely on Lipschitz conditions. Uh, and if you have, if you can guarantee Lipschitzness of the network and all activation functions used satisfy the Lipschitzness, you can then come up with a finite grid and then search the corners of the grid to deduce whether there is definitely no adversarial examples. Okay? And this is different from just searching, because once I've checked, I know that definitely there are none, you know, even uh, in between the coordinate points. So how did we do that? Well, if you take a typical image, not the one from the dashboard, because they have much lower dimensionality, but something like that, well, and searching for the one pixel that you want to flip from uh, red to green, 
that's um, a huge intractable surge. So that's just not practical. Um, so what we did is we applied uh, feature reduction. So we, instead of searching through the matrix, we searched in the feature space, but that was not enough. I said we already relied on lip sheetsness by gridding and reducing the search to finite search. But what we also did is we did a smart search via a game-based method, and I don't have time to talk about this, other than it just builds a game tree uh, where the, the search is by features. It is finite, because one image has finitely many pixels. And it uses Monte Carlo tree search, and that's the same method that was used to win at Go. So what we then can do is we can have an anytime algorithm which will compute the lower and an upper bound. And you know, really, the longer you run it, the better the bounds are. And I'm showing here some converging bounds. So the top two rows are actually images which are unsafe but the bottom rows are images that are safe. As you can see, they are all similar, but that's because it's a very small uh, diameter. Okay, but this is not uh, all that we can do. So this is for images, and it's motivated by perception in autonomous driving, uh, but I can also go further. So this is now videos. Now, a video is a series of frames where each frame is an image. And the methodology introduced for video by Andrew Sisselman at Oxford uh, uses a convolutional net to extract features and then a recurrent net to process the frames, the features of the frames. Okay, so for images, the manipulation was of individual pixels, but this will not work here. So what we had to do is we actually had to define manipulations for optical flow. Optical flow are the differences between consecutive images in the sequence. But everything else can be reworked because we are still in the RN space in fact, we switched from matri um, RN matrices to tensors. So the algorithm has a very similar structure and can still give us guarantees. And another example, again, an unusual perhaps example, uh, because uh, it is for language. Now language, again, we think it's discrete, but in fact, language models, which started with a kind of discrete encoding, they worked with the one-hot encoding of individual words, uh, they quickly discovered that this was not workable, so what they have done is they've developed word embeddings, and they are maps into a real-valued space, which the group words that are semantically similar to points that are near in the space, okay? So, because I had a method working for RN, we could also apply it in this context. And in fact, what we could do is we could test how good the models were and discover examples of lack of robustness because you just replace the word with a synonym and you get a completely different classification. But in some cases, you can also obtain a guarantee where you can't find a word that's, you know, that, that you can replace it and throw the classification. So that's a guarantee. Okay, so I'll go back to the uh, next sound uh, and I'll explain you know, what's happening. So uh, at the time, there was a competition called NEXA, which challenged the community 
uh, to develop a neural network that would classify images of these dashboard, you know, camera images uh, from cars and um, classify them into red and green traffic lights. So we took the winning network, we trained it on a training data set, validated it on the uh, test data set, 95%, okay? And then for each image in there, my student software, which uses Dr. Carlo Tree Search, found on average three pixels in a fraction of a second, where, you know, that you change, change the classification catastrophically. Okay, now, what was happening there? I uh, will now explain. So what we do with neural networks, you know, we train them. We want to have a neural network that works on infinitely many inputs, but we give it only finitely many points in two classes there, the light blue and the, the pink. And there is a decision boundary, but the network learns its own boundary. We know, okay, that's well understood. The network learns its own boundary, in many cases doesn't even know the difference. Okay? So once we trained it, we then take another set, the test data set, and compute accuracy on that test data set. So the 95% okay, was on the accuracy for those darker blue okay, examples. But for each of those examples, what you could do is you could set up an optimization problem which would try to search for weaknesses. So go try to go towards the decision boundary where the classification would flip. And uh, this is how you got the zero okay, accuracy. But here what I'm actually doing is an, I'm abusing an assumption, a critical assumption that is used in uh, neural network training. And that is that the distribution, input distribution for the training data set and the test data set has to be the same. I've changed the distribution, okay? But, you know, I have a feeling that many engineers just don't realize that and just don't remember that assumption. And verification is this example on the right where I rule out, I exhaustive search, by exhaustive search, I rule out uh, counter examples. Okay, right. So I will not dwell into alternative approaches. Uh, if you are interested, then I think a sort of summary of how these approaches work and uh, uh, to what extent, you know, they can work and they can give you provable guarantees. For example, the kind of limitations on uh, the input dimensionality, etc., and how the technology works, you can find that, find it in the paper. Right, okay, but the question I'm asking is, I've only showed you one way to compute robustness, and that is by lower bounding and upper bounding the maximum safe radius, that is the minimum distance to the decision boundary. And this was done using a game-based approach, uh, and I've shown you some examples that hopefully convince you that, you know, it is reasonably practical. It also has some advantages because it is model ag agnostic. I could apply essentially the same method to uh, CNN and RNN. Uh, and I can configure it with different distance metrics. So I can take L2, I can take L1, uh, and I can even take similarity measures, which is what we've done for the language. 
but of course there are you know many <laughs> other issues with that it is in fact a very simplistic notion uh, this local robustness and MSR guarantees it is a very simplistic notion and gives us concrete certification but it will not suffice why? Because we also need model explainability, we also need to consider robustness to interventions, which are not just changing uh, you know, pixels, but operations, manipulating operations on pixels, and you know, we want to have optimal policies, etc. And ideally, we want to learn robust models, uh, but for robust models for robust learning we are currently at the level of half spaces okay so <laughs> not even a neural network yet okay so i'll just show you one example of going beyond you know simple msr robustness and that is explainability uh, which is also linked to robustness okay so explainability, XAI, you know, it's a big umbrella term, and because neural networks are black boxes, people have come up with various ways to estimate the contribution of individual inputs to the network's decision. But that way of explaining is very weak. It's just mathematically not principled. And uh, in fact, what we need is a way to identify a subset of features that would then imply the network's decision. And this is linked to abductive reasoning, which was, which is, you know, well established in the so-called good, good old-fashioned AI. And in this case, what we have developed is we have. Um, develop a method using SMT that would compute these subsets of features and we also added a way to select the optimal because the problem with these explanations is you get a lot of possibly incomparable <laughs> sets of features of on input which connects to the uh, talk that we had earlier. Okay, so what you can do with this is we've taken then a network, a semantic um, um, sentiment analysis network, and what you see is you see two texts, a negative and a positive, and each of these individual words is an explanation in its own right. It's an explanation. So it just tells you that you have a very compact way to actually tell you how the network made the decision. I'm not saying this is whether the decision was right or not, but how the network has made the decision. But we've also seen uh, where networks um, can be oversensitive to tokens that it had not seen in the training data. Okay, so things like exclamation marks, it just doesn't know what to do with it, and may give you random answers. Right, so I think that's uh, uh, the end of kind of the talk, and I will just finish off by saying that so far, you know, I have focused on rigorous engineering, and this is something that, you know, can imbue trust in AI. Uh, and I've shown you some successes, but in fact there are many, many limitations and we have to, to make progress, we need to do a lot more. Uh, so everything so far was for supervised neural networks, but they are just in the long run not practical. Uh, we need ways to develop unsupervised robustness methods which would extract features you know, using computer graphics techniques from lots of images. Um, what we are not studying in machine learning is compositionality, 
I talked about guarantees, but for proving correctness of programs and networks, we talk about assume guarantees, you know, for modules, for modularity. We need to be able to say, okay, if I can assume something, then I can guarantee uh, the output. Of course, scalability, you know, efficiency and precision, etc. Um, and one aspect that I didn't dwell on is uncertainty, and that's linked to Bayesian method that also was mentioned, because the models uh, need to be able to say, I don't know, okay, when they classify, because otherwise you just have a lot of unsafe outputs and decisions. And finally, the difference between reasoning and statistics. And I think this is, uh, this is a, the subject of an ongoing debate in the AI community with some people who believe one and other people believe in the other and they say you know that you can completely exclude the other. The fact is that neural networks because of the way that they are trained they learn correlations. So they learn statistical features they do not learn to reason in a way that we think of reasoning. For example, one plus one is two. But people still go to chat GPT to test that. Okay. Uh, but there's no reason to expect that the answer is correct because that is not how the objective was set up. The objective was to give you plausible continuations, human, you know, plausible continuations, not correct answers. And, okay, this is my bit for education. Now, AI is in the news. It's uh, a lot in the news, but it has also been in the news for the wrong reasons. <laughs> And I think part of you know what I'm doing is that I kind of want to educate the community that they are not bad tools, but we need to be able to use them you know in the correct way, and we have to set our expectations accordingly. Right now, people are just very excited about you know AI, but AI. And you know, even ChatGPT is a very good tool. Also, AlphaFold is a very good tool, but it will not solve other problems. All other problems. So that's uh, the end. And just have some concluding remarks. But maybe uh, uh, I don't need to go with them because I think it's lunch time, and I, I just need to show acknowledgments. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes for possible questions. Ooh. Hello, I was wondering, you were talking about how uh, neural networks existing in continuous space sort of makes it a little bit different from discrete space. I was wondering, with computers, we of course represent numbers with floating point numbers and you know neural nets might be changing to end date or whatever these dif different implementations are. Are the methods that you've discussed I guess subject to these or are you able to get around these issues by the sort of different models that you've taken? No, I mean that is a very good point. No, people are so excited about neural networks and seeing what they can produce that they don't worry about these things. I know of one or two papers that start, started looking at, you know, finite precision floating point. Because, you know, in verification, I mean, I had, I had developed uh, this, you know, probabilistic model checker, and uh, there was a paper a few years ago which actually showed that we under approximated the value function by something like 10 to the minus 12. But people use neural networks, you know, and the only reason 
they have to work with real value spaces is because of the way that they are trained. Yeah. yeah. Moreover, those neural networks are now being run on half precision computers to run them faster. So they are not only not worrying about this, but they are killing the precision on the computers. Isn't it? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm just educating, you know. I'm not trying to stop progress. This is a very exciting time and very good, you know, for us, for our students, you know, for the future. But this is not the way to end on. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, I, uh, I'm a PhD student working at German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence and um, my focus is using synthetic data for training your networks by something from a video game. And uh, so my uh, work is mostly on the training, but with uh, the new driving simulators coming into play for driving, autonomous driving, like NVIDIA guys are you know, making one. So my question is, do you think that it's, uh, it's helpful for using these driving simulators to, to test different scenarios and identify the weaknesses of your network? Because there are infinitely many uh, permutations that you can generate. Of course, it's not uh, mathematically thorough, but uh, it's, it's scalable. Uh, and uh, in, in years to come, of course, there will be improvements in photorealism. And do you think that trend, uh, gaining traction, or do you think that there are inherently many difficulties that don't really solve the problems that you mentioned? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Now, we are also working with driving simulators, Kana, for example. So I, I think that they do have the users. So okay, we were developing a basic network controllers, you know, for that. Uh, now, uh, the, the situation is very similar to the situation with software verification. Software verification is computationally expensive. So it should only be used for cases where you, know, you, you, you have high potential loss. And it tends to be used for critical components or critical protocols. But you cannot uh, remove from from the safety assurance pipeline is testing, and you know simulators are just very good environments to do testing. Of course, what simulators have to have is realistic data, and we know that the world is stochastic, and there are a lot of rare events. So simulations are not perfect and I think even verification will look to statistics for something like rare events. We look to statistics to come up with better abstractions of the models to then estimate, you know, oh, does that rare event really matter? Of course it will only matter if there is a connection to a crash or something similar or a you know, huge financial loss. And we know we've been there in the financial markets. You know, the, the, the software with flaws has caused a lot of problems and a lot of losses. Uh, and, okay, Tesla is just doing automatic updates overnight. <laughs> Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Uh, I have one remark. Uh, because trust is, of course, very complex, vague concepts. And uh, we need also, uh, I think, this top down the composition, uh, just going on maybe from the complex documents or you know, standards like in software engineering. Before we reach this level, you are talking about neural networks. Uh, uh, we can talk. Uh, about uh, this interface between uh, this abstract and, and uh, hardware part. And uh, this is related also to this what Professor Zatek was emphasizing, that we do not have this automatic tools for the decomposition of such vague specifications, uh, that only human beings are able to somehow decompose this and so uh, 
uh, if you ask if the neural network is not obeying some principles which are dangerous, uh, before we reach this level, it's also a lot of work. But Yeah, I mean, you're completely right about specifications. I mean, these specifications are not spe specifications in a sense that, say, any properly trained software engineer would consider specifications. So even if you, you take the example, adversarial examples, the Panda, famous Panda image, okay, we are, we are uh, uh, overlaying our human understanding of what a Panda should like. Okay, we are not really looking at the specification of what the specification for the panda should be. So you are completely right about that. Now for trust, yes, uh, I mean also you are completely right. I'm talking about the world as is because these developments are moving very, very fast. So I'm you know, talking about the little steps that we can take to improve, you know, perhaps come up with some guarantees, not just me, there is now a community, there is a website which tracks the certified radius for various classes of neural networks. But trust, the reason I mention trust is because trust is linked to the interaction, interaction with robots. Now, before robots, we had automation, okay? The difference between standard automation, where trust was first studied, and robots is that robots have autonomy. So that's why trust has to be revisited and considered. And I, you know, it's, uh, it's a notion that I mean, I've worked with papers and people from psychology, from economics, because that's where these concepts are studied, and that's because we computer scientists have to consider autonomous behavior, you know, in, in the real world, I should say, in the real world. Thank you very much uh, for a very exciting talk. Very interesting, very. And um, I would like to thank you for being with us. Now you have a work lunch. So see you in one hour of the next session. Thank you very much.